Welcome to What Next for Genomics, providing answers, changing lives, transforming the NHS. I'm Sarah Norcross and I'm the director of the Progress Educational Trust. Progress Educational Trust is a charity we were founded back in 1992 to advance public understanding of science, law and ethics in the fields of human genetics, assisted conception and embryology. And what the Progress Educational Trust aims to do is to improve the choices for people who are affected by genetic conditions and infertility. And we do this by promoting the responsible application of science and engaging with the public. And we do this by leading the debate, identifying the challenging topics and providing the forum and encouraging meaningful public discussion of the issues. Influencing policy so that it's better aligned with science and reflects the best interests of patients and the public. And thirdly, by informing and explaining, holding events like this one and publishing accurate and unbiased news every week in BioNews. So it's extremely fitting for us to be working with Genomics England to bring you this event to mark the launch of the Chief Medical Officer's report, Generation Genome. We're thrilled to be part of Genomic England's Genomics Conversation Initiative as it enters its next phase. Because we really share Genomic England's view that it's crucial to make sure that we understand and address people's concerns and that we earn and continue to retain their trust in what is this transformational medical advance. And we're looking forward to the next event that we've got, um, we plan to do within Manchester in September. We're similarly delighted to be holding this event here at the Wellcome Collection. The Wellcome has supported our work for many years now, and we're honoured to have recently been granted a Sustaining Excellence Award from them to carry out much needed development work for our charity. So tonight's chair is Mark Henderson. Mark is Director of Communications here at the Wellcome Trust and has been responsible for many initiatives, including the wonderful digital science magazine Mosaic. Previously, Mark was the science editor at the Times, and that was when I first got to know Mark. And in all the media briefings I went to back in the day, Mark was there on the front row with thoughtful and incisive questions for the people on the panel. So it gives me really great pleasure, because this is the first time we've involved Mark in one of our evening events, for Mark to reprise that role, but not to be on the front row, but actually on the stage and asking those questions. So I'm going to hand you over to Mark. So thanks, Mark. I'll give you a little clap in advance. Wow. <laughs> thank you, thank you, Sarah, and thank you all for joining us uh, tonight at what should be, I think, a really interesting uh, evening. As you're aware, uh, we're very fortunate to be joined tonight by the Chief Medical Officer, Dame Sally Davis, who has today published her annual report on the future of genomics in the UK, especially in the NHS. And she's going to give us 15, 20 minutes of introduction to uh, the report, her vision, and what she sees as, as, as happening uh, in the development of genomics in the NHS today. And we're going to follow that up with a brief discussion that will bring together three other experts from different aspects of this challenge. We uh, have uh, Professor Sue Hill, who's the Chief Scientific uh, Officer at NHS England, Sir Steve O'Rahley, who is a Professor of Clinical Biochemistry and Medicine uh, at the University of Cambridge, and Professor Mike Parker, who is the Chair of Genomics England's Ethics Advisory Committee and also Director of a new Wellcome Trust Centre uh, that's devoted to uh, ethics and medicine. Uh, we'll be having a short uh, discussion up here on the panel immediately after Dame Sally's uh, remarks, and then it'll be over to you for questions and further discussion. So many of you will have seen the excellent coverage of Dame Sally's report and the great excitement and sense of potential, uh, but also challenge around how we're going to be able to uh, advance genomics within the NHS, move from a situation that we've all been talking a lot about over the past uh, decade and a half, and moving that into a situation 
uh, where many more patient lives are impacted by the development of this technology and this science. So I'd like to welcome Dame Sally uh, to the stage to uh, open up with her talk. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sarah, Mark, for the invitation. But actually, I should start by saying thank you to the patients who work with us and who have allowed us to develop this science to where it is so that it actually begins to mean something for far more people. And then, of course, to the chapter authors, and I've seen Steve and Mike and Ron Zimmern and there are others in the audience, Mark Caulfield, who I want to thank. For me, this is a very exciting day, and I'm going to try and explain to you why. My role is a statutory role that was put in place 168 years ago. I'm the 16th and the first woman. And one of the tasks I have is to write an annual report. And many of you will know I went about this differently from predecessors. And in fact, Tom edited the first. Claudia has expertly edited this one with support from Orla. I got the experts to write the chapters. So my role is to choose the subject, choose the experts. We agree what the subject areas are. They write the chapters. We all debate, so what does this mean for us and our system here? And then with the chief editor, we write the policy chapter. What does it mean? And I make the recommendations, and we ask people's advice and help. It's a very iterative process. It's quite a long-winded process. Claudia was saying she started a, more than two years ago on this particular one. Thank you, everyone, for staying with us on it. Um, I think we've ended up with something that we can be proud of. I also want to thank the Science Media Centre, Fiona Fox, because at Fiona's suggestion, instead of launching it from the Department of Health with a press conference, we did a science briefing here at the Science Media Centre. And that was a very good way to do it, because it was the scientists, three of them with me, talking to the science writers about it. So it wasn't just on my shoulders, and we got over much more of the richness. So why would I want to do genomics? Well, I was explaining to these science writers yesterday that when I was interviewed for medical school, and I got into quite a few actually, and they said, why do you want to do medicine? I said, because of the DNA helix. I want to do what's now become genomics, but molecular biology. I want to understand it. I want to work with it. I actually cloned genes in the early 80s and have done my bit at the lab, in the lab. I don't have green fingers. I'm not very good at it. I have been saddened that our health professionals have taken a long time to work out where this science is going, because I believe it's going to transform our NHS in the next five to 10 years. And I am increasingly of the mind that it's here already. We have got patients who are getting the best genomic medicine you could have in this country, thanks to wonderful scientists, great clinicians working together. But actually, that's costing us a lot of money, and it's not equitable, it's not fair, and it's not going to maintain our leadership position, because undoubtedly, thanks to much investment, much of it from the Wellcome Trust and the MRC, we have a leading position in genomic science. I want us to have a leading position in helping patients. I want us to spread this across the country. And so how do we move from something that has served us very well? I'm not castigating anyone. I think our, what I've called a cottage industry that's grown up around genomic medicine has grown up around science expertise, clinician interest, served us well. But as I'm going to show you, I don't believe it's the way we should go forwards. And also, we've been having a difficult debate about data, and I wanted to face that head on and discuss that, so we will. So I've told you I'm interested, I have a background, and I became much more intimately involved 
Well, first of all, I have to declare my interest through my husband, who uh, does genomics in Cambridge, uh, in part in the university on the Adambrooks campus, in part at the Sanger. So I'm kept up to date with pillow talk. But also through um, the 100,000 Genome Project. So it was when I set up and ran NIHR, me who said, we'd better fund the 100,000 Genome Project. It was me that fought for the model that we have, which is of an entrepreneurial startup company with the Department of Health as the sole shareholder. But it's not something we're about to privatize. This belongs to the NHS family, but it takes bureaucrats out of it. It puts scientists, clinicians, process engineers in control to make it deliver. And my golly, it has been difficult. Thank you, Mark, for sticking with us. Thank you, uh, John Chisholm, for being bossy with us all and getting us where we've got to. We have not delivered to the timetable we wanted to. But we've not delivered for very good reasons. We've been learning. I mean, I assumed that the usual tumour samples pickled would work for DNA. Everyone assumed they don't. So Sue Hill has led this wonderful transformation programme in the NHS with pathology labs and surgeons for snap freezing um, fresh frozen samples. That took a long time. A lot of doctors also said, why would I bother with that when I can get a service there? What am I doing? And it's taken time to get to where we are. Over 31,000 whole genome scans done. It's also brought the price down. When uh, John Chisholm started in uh, 2013 at the Easter or early summer, I think it must have been, the price of a whole genome scan was £7,000. It's now just under £700. It will go on coming down. It needed a businessman with a very hard nose to get us that price for our patients in the NHS to open the door to making these transformations for our patients. And so I put the 100,000 Genomes Project up front in this because science is great and we need it. But if we're going to make differences for patients, that's either got to make new drugs and new approaches, diagnostics, or it's got to deliver in the NHS for our patients. And I think, because of 100,000 Genomes Project, the NHS is getting there, having commissioned 13 NHS genomic medicine centres and all sorts of things. So I've divided it into a number of areas. There's one on precision medicine. We've talked about genomics and therapeutics, developing medicines, cancer diagnostics, and I think you're all pretty expert at that, rare diseases. I slipped in behind rare diseases Obesity, because there were three sections to the obesity chapter that Steve has written. One, those rare cases, a few per thousand or two, who have generally a single gene defect that gives them very severe obesity in childhood that need their genes scanned and then the appropriate treatment. The other is that block of some, I've forgotten how many, 70 or more genes that confer risk but actually, what does that mean? And how does that play out and where are we going? And then, of course, the opportunity to discover new drugs through this. The other area, which must be later, that we've been looking at through the 100,000 Genome Project is infection, and I'll come back to that. The rare diseases is where the 100,000 Genome Project has come into its own. Rare diseases defined as one in less than 2,000 people. But with three and a half million people in England with a rare disease, that's not rare. That's a massive load for those families and in the NHS. So looking at that as an issue and having a chapter on that. And each of the chapters has many different authors in order to bring it all together. In the genomics and therapeutics, we picked up about new target identification, repurposing of medicines. One of the examples is using riboflavin for childhood motor neurone disease. These are wonderful stories. They're targeting specific mutations, because I know 
adults, actually, with cystic fibrosis. I'm particularly interested in the 4% that respond to Ivacaftor, but the treatment of their murafenib, but I do have problems with these words, for malignant melanoma and other ways of targeting, fantastic. Stratification, I've been trying to explain in the media I've been doing today, that from the cancer genomes that have gone through, already we know that 60, two thirds have got actionable genes. That means that they know from those genes either that there's a good treatment or that certain treatments won't work. So that's much savings for the NHS, but better outcomes for patients. And also about side effects if there are going to be ghastly adverse events. So two thirds of patients already from what we know, actionable genes, that makes a difference to people with cancer. And that feeds through to their families. Will we get them back to work earlier? Will we get them back into purposeful life? We can if we go on working at this. There's also dose individualization, and the classic one is a six mercaptopurin that I used to dish out like smarties in acute lymphoblastic leukemia of children, warfarin, the blood thinning, and I've mentioned um, drug safety. I don't think I'm going to go further into this, but I do want you to read all these chapters, except I would say it takes me a weekend to read this report every time I read it. And I think I've read it five times. And still, I can't get all the richness. After precision medicine, there are a few other areas I've brought in. Obesity I've mentioned. Personalized prevention. What is the role in the future of finding risk genes and what does that mean in public health and how will that work with behavior and the interaction as we learn more? And then the pathogen genomics, and yesterday Julian came to talk to that, but I've uh, just seen Sharon, the main author, up there. Thank you, Sharon. And pathogens, bugs, it's already in practice. Around the world, people are looking at HIV and finding the resistant organisms through genome scanning. Around the world, and here in this country, PHE, Public Health England, is scanning TB. People are getting treatments earlier and ones that work. It's really very, very exciting. And I think there's a great opportunity as we go forward with um, pathogen genomics in the field of antimicrobial resistance. But I won't get going on that, which is another one of my passions today. We've got some chapters on screening. I enjoyed reading three times, probably. The risk stratified cancer screening, one looking at mathematical modeling. There's what is the role of genomics in newborn screening, and I think I absolutely agree with the authors that at the moment it isn't the right approach, but we must always keep it under review and giving the reasons why. And then non-invasive prenatal testing, that is using the technology that finds fetal DNA in the mother's blood free and screening it, and you can pick up Down syndromes. The screening program is going to look at what they call contingent screening. I have to say it's taken me a while to get my head around what contingent screening is. And this means that women at high risk, instead of having lots of tests with a false negative rate and then and a false positive rate and then um, going for invasive procedures, will have that test. But while we do contingent screening, there are 25 to 30% of women who have Downs children who were not high risk, and they're not being offered that. So I've asked them to look at the cost effectiveness as the costs of doing the tests come down. We move on to sequencing, and there are lots of data challenges. There's the challenges of big data, the challenges of analysis. Genomics England has the only semi-automated pipeline for calling variants in the world because the bioinformatics is so strong. The fact that you should only do it once for the nation. The other bit that I want to thank um, Viv and Sarah and Kat for is the work you've done with patients thinking about data. 
And the way I've been trying to explain it is my genome, when it's transcribed or scanned and transcribed, is data about me. It's not my data. I don't own it. It's data about me. So do I want it shared? Well, sharing conjures up the idea of a lovely box of chocolates on the desk, and we can all go and take one. I don't know that that's quite what I want. Do I want it used in a safe environment? Oh, absolutely I do. I want it used to give me the latest diagnosis. And that means putting it into the database because then it'll be based on the latest science, whereas if I wait for my clinician to do it, first of all, they may not understand the subject because he's a very specialist. Secondly, they'll have to do it on published literature. So by definition, it's one or two years out of date. So I want to give my agreement to the data about me being used effectively in my interests and the public's interests. But that is on condition it's properly looked after, and it has to be. So the database for genomics for the NHS will be the Genomics England one. Let me just tell you a bit about that. There's the NHS firewall, and it's pretty safe, and we can debate this. And you can say what you want, and I'll, I'll write post being me. I'm very robust. But then within that, we have other security features on the Genomics England database. First of all, it's de-identified. Secondly, who on earth would want some unlabeled DNA sequence? Because it's very long, big, unwieldy. You can't snatch bits of it. What would you do with it? Thirdly, access is only for people who've got specific permission, and it's been agreed what's going to happen to it. And fourthly, we know who's been into that database. We know where they came from. We know what they looked at and how they did it. It is extraordinarily safe. Yes, I'm asking the public to trust us. But actually, there is a legal framework, and if someone insists on being criminal, then I will be among the first to ask for a, a criminal sentence. We need to build on the conversation that Genomics England and Sarah have had going forwards with the public. We need to build that conversation to build the understanding and the trust. But I tell you, it's pretty safe. So a lot of stuff about data, some about the economics of sequencing. The one bit I'd want to say at this point is that if we want the best sequencing and the best price, you have to centralize it and put it in factories. Because these new high throughput machines cost so much, we can't have them dotted around the country. And if you have a high throughput machine or two in a factory, then you'll get the best quality, the fastest turnaround, the cheapest price, so we'll get results for far more patients for what's being spent now, moving from the cottage industry to that. And because it's only one or two machines, we can buy a new one in every 18 months to two years when a new machine becomes available. So there's the important bit of the economics of sequencing. We should benefit our patients by doing it. The final part is about the ethical and societal considerations, the need for a social contract between the professionals, the NHS, and the public and patients. And I've also looked quite carefully at the concordat moratorium between the Department of Health and the insurance industry because I thought we were going to need a new law. As I look at it, it is horribly complex, but it works, it's good, and it gets reviewed regularly. I do not think we need a new law. I think we need to keep it under review and make sure that the financial levels of protection for patients and people who've had genomic scans, uh, 300,000 at the moment for critical life uh, insurance and 500,000 for a mortgage is upped with inflation as necessary. So there's a big section on that. So what's my dream? And I'm coming to an end here. It's about spreading this. It's here now. Everyone should have access. And then we'll get better patient outcomes, and that's what we want. I think it'll motivate the workforce. 
actually doing this, but we've got to train the workforce, make the whole workforce genome savvy. I'm sure I could find a better word, but anyway, I want them to understand it, to want to do it. I want the patients to demand it. It'll keep us at the forefront of, world, of genomic science in the world, and that'll be good, but we can only do this if we absolutely move forward, all of us together. So I've made recommendations in a number of areas that we can talk to, but I'm sure you'll look it up on your phones or you've got the summary chapter or something. Starting with a ministerially led genomics board to make sure that this is gripped and that the funding is found and it works forward, right through to engaging staff, patients and the public. Thank you very much. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you, James Sally. And could I invite the panel up as well to join us on the front here now? Sue, could I ask you just to start with just a, a few words of, of response, perhaps with your NHS hat on? Yes, thank you very much, Mark. I'd like to congratulate CMO Dame Sally for this comprehensive and considered report. She has shown real thought leadership in this area and has played a personal role in making this country a world leader in genomics. What this report does is it highlights the opportunities that embracing cutting-edge genomic technologies, coupled with in-depth clinical phenotypic data, has to transform the lives of people. Supporting predictive and preventative health approaches a more precise diagnosis in cancer, rare disease, and infectious disease, in our ability to personalize treatments and interventions and really drive the drug discovery efforts. Importantly, the, research, the report demonstrates the needs for collaborative partnerships between the NHS, between researchers, between industry, but also with international collaborators but most importantly, with patients and their families, to really maximize the pace of advance and to ensure the best possible outcomes for our patients and our public. The report sets a clear vision for the future, a future that is possible because of the long history of genetics and genomics in the NHS, but also in our academic community. Now is the time, as Sally has outlined, for a step change to deliver the full potential of the genomic revolution that we face. The question for the NHS is how we can best respond and adapt so that we assure that those who could benefit have the opportunity to benefit. For the NHS, this means we need to systematically embed the approach into routine healthcare we need to drive the standardization that Sally's outlined. We need to improve the quality. And more importantly, we need to reduce the variability that we see. This has to be driven by value-based outcomes and informed by robust health economic analysis, concepts clearly outlined in this report. The 100,000 Genomes Project has been a significant and important catalyst providing the proof of principle evidence for mainstreaming whole genome sequencing in the NHS. It has positioned the 13 NHS genomic medicine centers and the transformational change they have led alongside industry and research endeavors. This has truly embraced the end-to-end -end innovation pathway driving adoption at a pace that we haven't seen with many other national initiatives. And certainly in NHS England, we're seeing this as a blueprint for other transformational change that could be uh, achieved. You've already heard from Sally that the project's success has been based on the willingness and enthusiasm of patients and their families to engage and contribute to this area of science and medicine. We need to build on the strong foundations that have been uh, created and engage in the broader public dialogue to ensure that patients and the public are confident in the use of these technologies and their use of their data in a de-identified way to drive both the research and the industry endeavors, but also to enhance the interpretation for their clinical care. But in that broader conversation, we need to mitigate any concerns that they have. 
In NHS England, we're continuing to work on the step drain to deliver Sally's genomic dream. Key to this is the creation of the infrastructure for the future, and we're doing this in a partnership with Genomics England, who will deliver many of the infrastructure that's required for the future from 1819. To create a national genomic medicine service that delivers benefits to patients, regardless of where they live, the illnesses they have, or where their care is provided, we will introduce a new genomic laboratory network for rare disease, cancer, and other conditions, building upon the recommendations that Sally's made. Secondly, we'll introduce a genomic test directory to direct the commissioning system from single genes up to whole genome sequencing and embracing over time other elements of the functional genomics pathway. But in doing that, we'll replace the obsolete tests that in the NHS we continue to add and therefore add costs. And we will introduce an evolving role for our NHS genomic medicine centres to further transform pathways of care, but to create the multidisciplinary team infrastructure that Sally has outlined in her report that will be critical for the future. In finishing then, the NHS is on a journey to embedding genomic medicine. This has been supported by the Health Education England Genomics Education Programme, but there's much more we need to do to ensure that the workforce has the skills and competences to respond. And Sally set out some very helpful recommendations about what needs to happen. This is a really exciting time and I look forward to working together over the coming months and years as we make the future that Sally has so powerfully and compellingly set out in this report a reality. Brilliant. Thank you, Sue. Can I hand over to Mike? <laughs> Mike, over, over to you for some brief responses. Okay. I'd like to begin by thanking Sally for asking me to write the chapter for this report, which I'm really delighted to have done. <laughs> with um, Professor Annika Lucasen and Professor Jonathan Montgomery as a, a joint piece of work, which is really interesting. And I'd also like to thank Sally for asking me to be the chair of her advisory group, the ethics advisory group leading up to the start of the 100,000 Genomes Project. I think my role this evening is just to say a few words about ethics and to open up that discussion. And I'd like to start by emphasizing the rather obvious point that ethics is not only about problems, it's also about what we should do and what we ought to be praised for doing. And it's clear that there are good ethical and moral reasons for aiming to develop the best healthcare system we can and to provide excellent care equitably on the basis of need. There are, of course, ethical challenges arising out of the uses of genomics, and I'll come to those in a moment. But their mere existence doesn't override our obligation to provide the best healthcare we can, where any ris risks of so doing are proportionate and minimalized. Now, as you've heard, the CMO's report is as much about data as it, as it is about genomics, and I really welcome that. And it's undeniable that, as in other areas of life that we can all think of, the potential for some uh, hugely important improvements in treatment and diagnosis is offered by data-driven approaches. And these will include advances for the individual patient. The promise is that you'll go to your doctor and have your depersonalized data run against a large database of other people's depersonalized data, a kind of health information search engine. And through that process of comparison, your diagnosis and treatment will be improved by an, by an informed, sorry, by an analysis of the most up-to-date relevant knowledge. And at one at the same time, your data will contribute to the updating of that knowledge base, and the search engine will be better still for the next person, the next people who need it. And what this means is that it seems likely that the best medicine is going to increasingly depend upon a greater degree of interdependence between the care and treatment of patients on the one hand and the collection and analysis of data on large numbers of patients on the other. And we need to recognize, of course, that there are potential risks with this new kind of medicine as well as benefits. The risks might relate, for example, to privacy concerns or worries about the involvement of commercial or technology partners. But we also, and perhaps we'll come to those later, but we also need to be clear that there are risks on both sides here. The risks associated with not adopting tools capable of providing the best possible healthcare are significant. And we would need to have very good reason indeed to avoid the development and use of such tools. Now, in our chapter of uh, Sally's report, we argue that for the benefits of genomic and data-driven practice to be obtained, their development and the arrangements for their provision must be capable of commanding well-founded public trust and confidence. And, and the emphasis here is on the well-founded, I think. And we call for the agreement of a new social contract capable of doing this. And perhaps social contract is a bit too formal or 
uh, abstract a term. But what we mean by this is that the NHS and other relevant organisations, and with the genuine involvement and engagement of patients and the public, should work to establish clearly agreed and mutually endorsed statement of what patients and the wider public can reasonably expect with respect to the collection, storage and uses of their data and in the provision of genomic medicine. Now, we also make some comments about consent. And consent is extremely important. It needs to be done well, and there are no excuses for doing it badly. However, we also need to recognise that it's always based on imperfect knowledge, and it's not in itself capable of guaranteeing ethical <coughs> practice. We've tended to place far too much reliance on consent. We need to recognise it's only one, an important one, part of the ethics ecosystem. And how do we identify the other parts of the ethics ecosystem? Well, I think the way we do this is to ask ourselves the following question. Assuming that even good consent is imperfect, what other protections do we need to put in place to ensure that those who give their consent to data-driven genomic medicine are not seriously harmed or discriminated against as a consequence? And we can talk more about that later. Sally's mentioned some of those things. And finally, my final point is, perhaps surprisingly, if you were to ask me what's the most important ethical issue presented by genomics and data-driven science, I think it's likely to be do, to do with priority setting, resource allocation, and equity. First, equity. How can we ensure that the benefits of data-driven genomic healthcare is available to all who need it? This is not something that will just happen. And for me, a key, a key requirement of the social arrangement capable of creating well-founded public trust and confidence is that, a system that, is, that it is a system that actively pursues equity of healthcare access. Now, there's lots of evidence that, for example, people from black and minority ethnic groups, but other groups too, don't access genetic services currently on an equitable basis. And this and other equitable equity issues need to be addressed as part of that social contract. And secondly, resource allocation and priority setting. I won't say much about this, but it's clear that genomic medicine and data-driven healthcare are going to, f the, the benefits of that are going to far outweigh the resources available to us. And that means difficult decisions are going to have to be made within, within that field, but also against other services that we might want to provide within the NHS. And those are going to be difficult conversations that need to, need to be done on the basis of reasoned debate, accountability, transparency, and, and involvement of the public. So, thank you. Brilliant. Thank you very much, Mike. And uh, let's um, move on much now to come back to. Uh, Steve, do you want to yes. respond briefly and then we'll so, move on? Sally and, and your colleagues, I'd like to congratulate you, Claudia, Orla, and uh, my fellow co-authors on an insightful uh, and wise and, and ultimately will be a useful report. My response will be much less structured and, and less well, uh, pre-organized than my wonderfully articulate colleagues, but I'd like to make comments with, from three different perspectives. The first perspective is that of, a, of a, simply an interested and concerned citizen of this country. And I think we should all be really proud of a country and privileged, we are privileged to live in a country where such a, a report can be written. Because every chapter I, I've read in my whistle-stop tour of it over the last uh, couple of days since I saw an early draft, every chapter is characterized by a combination of intellectual depth, clinical understanding, a patient perspective. It's written articulately and in an engaging fashion. And above all, there's no condescension written in any, any of the chapters, and there are no punches pulled about the limitations of, uh, of genomics and the possible uh, uh, future uh, hope that it, that it provides. From the point of view uh, of a, a bioscience researcher in, in the UK, my, my, my comments are that I see the possibilities looking into the future as limitless. Uh, I think we grossly underestimate saying that there are 7,000 rare diseases. There are probably double that. And, and there are many people suffering from, from diseases that we haven't yet recognized in, my, in our own little cottage industry. Over the years, we've discovered more than 30 using primitive tools. And I'm sure in the UK, there will be many individuals suffering from those rare diseases and, and that are currently misunderstood that we'll understand in a far better way because of the, of the, the, the uh, initiatives that you've, you, you've started. And secondly, the, the power of bringing together the clinical science with discovery science in academia and industry will, I am sure, bring many more examples where we can make new therapies that are of general, general significance uh, and profound significance to, to, to the UK and UK, UK patients from that uh, c combination of databases. There are a few countries in the world where you could get major leaders such as yourself, the head of the Medical Research Council, the Wellcome Trust uh, senior people and charities in the one room in a coordinated manner, and I think that's what we have in the UK is a fantastic opportunity to pull all those people uh, uh, together. And you, you and your colleagues have, have done that magnificently 
conceitedly. And thirdly, as a practicing doctor, I'd just like to uh, thank you because we've looked after people with metabolic diseases for many years and among the most neglected individuals have been those with obesity because they are largely, largely tarnished with the brush of self-indulgent and, self, and self-damaging uh, uh, behaviors with a poor understanding that many of these children have got fundamental underlying genetic disease. And that's been very hard to get across with your insight and compassion, you have seen that that's a real problem, and I hope that we'll see some real tangible uh, benefits for those patients as a result of this report. So thank you for that. Thank you all. Just to kick off a little bit of discussion, Sally, you you mentioned there's a phrase that comes up again and again through your report around democratisation of the genome, and I think Mike touched on some of those issues, as did, did both Steve and Sue in their remarks as well around equity and the potential to really have patient benefit here. What do you mean by democratisation and how do we achieve it? Well, the other expression I've used which relates is stop taking patients to science and take science to patients. It is about accepting that healthcare is changing or has changed Uh, And we now need to scramble to catch up and use genomics effectively in the interests of improved health. I think it will come for prevention, but I think at the moment we see it for health diagnosis and health care. And that means that we do have to make sure we have an equitable service across the country. We can only do that if it's an affordable, high-quality laboratory service. But if both the patients ask for it, and the professional staff know they should be offering it and understand the advantages. So it's a democratisation through education of everyone that this is where our NHS needs to be. I like the idea, I've called it a purchasing list, but um, Sue had a better, much better phrase, what will it be you did? So this is a genomic directory to yes, drive the, directory. the commissioning I system. Think the number of things that we'll, we'll be able to test for effectively and if equitably across the NHS will rise as science improves. Um, we will need a prioritisation, and they were pushing me today we, on the media, say that every cancer patient needs their genome scanning. Well, it's not for me to say. We need the experts, scientists and clinicians to come together and say, at this point, these are the ones we should be scanning. But then let's do it for everyone. And the only way we'll achieve that is by having no cottage industry, but moving to cheap, effective laboratories, and Sue has started that process. Your other phrase, you've used it four or five times tonight already, is cottage industry. What do you mean by that? I mean that we have little laboratories and groupings of clinicians and scientists and bioinformaticians in a number of places, and this needs Factories for the laboratories in general. I mean, what's the point of? I know one hospital that charges £2,000 for a genome array. Well, if we can do the whole genome for less than 700 we should do that and extract the SNPs, the little mutations that are needed, um, and not fund that lab. We know we haven't got enough bioinformaticians. We know, particularly for rare diseases, that needs concentrating so people have understanding. We need to bring together critical mass. Cottage industries don't have the critical mass that modern science needs for delivering best patient care. I think, obviously, you can see how that's a model that makes huge sense in theory. And it'll be cost-effective. In the end. But will there be upfront investment that's required in order to drive that? And, of course, when you're trying to drive change like this, there are often interests in the system that, are, that, that can be difficult to overcome in the short run. Well, luckily, it's Sue's job, not mine, but let me say... I'm coming to Sue next. <laughs> the biggest Giving her forewarning of the question. Yes. The biggest problem will be the doctors who believe that they're protecting their service, their laboratories, who have not woken up to how science has changed. Science has changed from people having only wet labs to them having dry labs. Science has changed from the power of doing the wet lab experiment, they still are needed, don't get me wrong, but to using the data and analysing it. They need to wake up to how life and for good science has changed. And if we can get them 
if democratized, then the money that is being spent can be spent to provide better services for far more patients. And it's wrong to invest more until we use the money in the system effectively. Why should the taxpayer pay more to deliver the ego of some doctor? There's the challenge. And it's his challenge. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, so, as I outlined, we are uh, introducing a comprehensive genomic medicine service from 1819, really to address the things that Sally said. A lot of the molecular diagnostic developments have, all, have happened organically. Where we're going to be able to get the economies of scale and affordability is to do this in a consolidated, networked way. This means that we will have, and we are taking expert opinion on this and reviewing the evidence alongside uh, Genomics England, who've been really supporting this, is to say, what can we do differently? Why we can't continue to do testing, genomic testing in, this, in series, that costs us more than it would do to, do, uh, to uh, sequence a whole genome and get a better outcome, including, for example, as outlined in the report, uh, a 20 plus percent increase in diagnostic yield for our patients so we get a better outcome. But this has got to be done systematically. We have to understand what tests we need to do, for what conditions and by what technology, and we've never been We've never prescribed that, and that's the point that Sally's making. We've made, we've allowed individuals within individual laboratories to make a decision on how they will apply the technology. And can I just say, it has served patients well. I wouldn't want anyone to think that this wasn't done for the best of reasons and served patients well until now. But now, we're in absolute agreement working together, it's the time to start the change. Is that going to be the challenge in some ways, though, where, where there's a service that has served patients well, but people are fond of, that maybe they're personally invested in, um, or professionally invested in, that replacing that with something else, it, that, that's more than just a scientific change, it's a cultural change as well, is it? I mean, there's no doubt about it that we've got to win hearts and minds of people in, in the change to a more consolidated And by network. people there, you mean, you mean professionals, yes. yes. Yeah. And also sometimes patients who get wedded to a particular service. But what we're very clear about is where we have national and international expertise in certain areas, monogenic diabetes is a good example from Andrew Hattersley and Sean Ellard in, in Exeter. We wouldn't want to lose that expertise within the, within the system. So we have to build, as, as we've seen in pathology, where we've got high throughput robotic laboratories for some of the wet lab testing, the more um, for whole genome sequencing, an external provider for the NHS in the way that Sally's outlined, but really shifting what we do in the NHS to something that recognises the expertise in interpretation and analysis. And that's where we need to have this shift to make sure that we can embrace not only all the genomic technologies we need to apply in rare disease and provide the equity, for example, as Steve's outlined, for example, in severe obesity that we don't do routinely in the NHS now, but also for cancer care and cancer genomics where there is variability, but where we can drive better outcomes through the greater number of actionable genes that Sally's outlined, but also more patients being eligible for clinical trials, uh, which is really important uh, for industry, for NIHR, and for our general uh, research endeavour. Uh, Steve, as a, as a clinician, as well as a scientist, if we're, if we're moving towards some of these changes that, that Sue's talking about here and Sally's talking about in the report, the move to, away from a cottage industry towards a more uh, thought-through, centralised, uh, modern service, what, what would that mean for the way that you do medicine? 
Um, I think what it mean, will mean for us, the way we do medicine, particularly hospital-based medicine, is that the traditional barrier between medical genetics departments and other departments will have to break down because there's real expertise now among non-medical genetic departments in understanding of these. You mentioned Andrew Hattersley, you mentioned our own lab, etc. There are many others. Are, these people are not traditionally medical geneticists. They are tra they've come from other disciplines and have acquired deep understanding. And that ne deep understanding needs to come into what were traditionally the medical genetics departments. So I see a future where in every discipline, every organ-based or system-based discipline, there are people whose depth of knowledge of these disorders is, is, uh, is really being exploited for op optimally. Now, I think we will need medical genetics departments because there are unique skills in the counseling, in the family tracing, in, in elements that are not... I think we need to separate out the elements of this. There, there are these big, massive factories that can produce the genomic data. Then there are the central bioinformatics. But then there will be a need, I think, for local people with really deep understanding of disease areas, probably one or two in, <laughs> for each disease area. But then in each major hospital, we really have to take a genomics view of all these illnesses and, and not really leave it ghettoized in what were traditional medical genetics departments. We need to em embrace it among other uh, uh, groups of physicians and, and doctors. And Mike, from the ethical perspective, when you come into a question like this where we're moving from one way of doing things to, to another, what, what, what challenges do you see there? I mean, there, there are many of them, obviously, but I think one, of the, one way to start thinking yeah. about this is to think about, you know, one of the ways we start off our chapter was by highlighting the founding principles of the NHS, so mm -hmm. we, you know, the emphasis on uh, care provided free at the point of delivery, ec provided equitably on the one hand, but also the commitment to that care being excellent. And we've tended to pay more attention to the former to the, than the second, and I think if we're serious about excellent care, it inevitably presents, requires us to change what we do. And we had a first wave related to that sort of in, you know, life extending treatments and so on. And now we're facing challenges where, which require us to deal with the fact that advances in medicine are, are likely increasingly to be data driven and to depend upon the pooling, uh, not to avoid the use of the word sharing, the pooling and, and, and collective analyzing of patient data in order to provide the best treatment for us as individuals. And that's going to require us to think very different, differently about data about us, about the way in which we depend upon each other. We, uh, you know, it's not, it's not, I don't think it's so much about solidarity, it's about a recognition that the best healthcare is going to require us to work together effectively. And that, requires, that presents a whole range of ethical issues, but it also, I think, prevent, presents more fundamental uh, challenges to, for us to... To, to, to rethink, as, as we, we call it the social contract here, the way in which we're going to think about medicine in a way that the public, patients, can buy into and feel mm. confident about. And have, I, don't, I don't think we can say, trust us anymore, yeah. actually, to be honest. I think we have to create the condition for well-founded trust. And, and that depends upon involving patients and asking them for their views. To what extent is the ethical argument here influenced by the fact that, I mean, we heard Sally say in her talk that um, we're not at the moment talking about prevention for the well. We're talking by and large about diseases like cancer where the patient gets a direct benefit or, or a rare disease where a family may get a direct benefit. Does that change the ethical calculus to, at all? I mean, it changes first of all what we think of that whether the patient is the right term, to, uh, right. for one thing. The sharing of data, we've talked about the sharing of genomic data, the whole range of other kinds of data that might be relevant to healthcare um, too. We need to think, think seriously about the most effective healthcare for, for, for improving health, and much of that is going to be preventative and yeah. predictive in the future, and, and, and include more people. That has economic considerations, yeah. of course. And you mentioned in your uh, brief remarks the, the need to think beyond consent in terms of safeguards. What might some of those other safeguards you're thinking about be? Some of those, you know, it, it's uh, we can. I can say what some of those are, but it's very important to say that that it's about creating the conditions for trust and confidence, and that requires talking to patients and the public. So I can't, as a philosopher, as it were, I can't stand here and tell you what they are. But it seems <laughs> likely to me that it's going to involve addressing questions about, about consent and its limits, for one thing, about 
uh, information governance, high standards of security, what, what kind of uh, limits on use are going to be required in order for people to feel confident. Those have an ethical dimension to them. Sally mentioned the approach that 100,000 genomes have taken, which is requiring researchers to come in and do their work in a space where they can be observed, audited and checked. And that whenever I've been asked uh, you know, been in these kind of events when I've been asked to talk about this issue before, that actually seems to reassure a huge m number of people. And I think the other thing that reassures people is something that the Nuffield Council um, said in its working party report, which is the importance of, of real uh, sanctions against data, de particularly deliberate da data misuse, but also, of course, negligent data misuse as well. And I, I agree with, with Sally that the rules around insurance and these are, and sanctions are there, but I do feel more work needs to be done to make it apparent that they're there mm. and, um, uh, and, and, and and effective. Fantastic. Well, let's um, pause for a second to throw the discussion open. My name is Sabrina Taldar. I'm a PhD student at the Institute of Cancer Research. Um, so I just want to start by saying thank you to Dane and Sally for opening the genomics dialogue and putting genomics at the forefront of public consciousness. It's always good as a geneticist. I'm very happy about that. Um, my question was about your thoughts on the very frenzied media reporting, um, concentrating particularly on cancer um, and uh, the sequencing of all cancer uh, patients when they have been diagnosed. I feel there's been a conflation of this diagnostic odyssey that rare um, disease patients have been going through. Um, and I think that the five year timeline that's being described is um, unrealistic considering that by your own admission you've said that the 100,000 Genomes Project um, has not delivered to the timetable that you wanted. Um, so I think there's a, a real risk here of garnering real unrealistic expectations and rather than going from genetic exceptionalism, which you talk about in your report, uh, to thinking about genetics as being a panacea for all disease. And I think that's kind of how the narrative has been um, spun with today's um, announcement. So, uh, thank you. John Savile from the Medical Research Council. Sally's only just emitted from our council, and she's been there the whole time I've been there, since 2010. We've invested, getting on for 200 million in medical informatics. And at various times I've given interviews to the press which have elicited a public response. And I remember vividly a letter from a lady who said she was very happy for her data to be used for the benefit of other people, but not for industry. So I'd be grateful if the panel could cover that issue. I'm James Bink from the Genetic Alliance UK. Dame Sally, you said that the time was not right for genomics to play a part in newborn screening. And I think a lot of the public imagination has centred on our healthcare being driven by our personal genetic data. What do you see as the tipping point for making that dream a reality? I think, Sally, that works quite nicely with the first question. Are, are you being Panglossian over the top about this. So you are you unrealistically raising expectations? Well, I wasn't, but I have no control over the reporting. I actually thought the reporting was much better than we often get. You have heard me say this evening with Sue that I think we need this directory which decides the prioritization of what should be provided across the country. And that depends on what can be done and what will give best value for patients. It's not every, and I specifically said, not every cancer. Yet if already on what we know, two thirds of cancers are getting actionable genes, it is likely to rise, and it may well be that patients would benefit in time from all cancers being screened, but of course we know that it won't just be a diagnosis, it's then how the genes change and the drivers change through the course of the disease. So I think there was a lot of good understanding about what I was saying, but they're trying to translate that into something that, as a public, we can grasp, and it is about cancer diagnoses and outcomes. I was sorry they didn't talk more about both rare diseases and the diagnostic odyssey and about um, pathogens, but cancer is something that really gets the public uh, eye. On the neonatal screening to turn it round, 
uh, you will know that um, some of the, we test for nine serious diseases along the Wilson and Younger criteria, which I can go into. But essentially, we look at the proteins for the diagnosis. And that protein change can be caused in some of the diseases by multiple genetic changes. And what we're most interested in is not the genetic change, but is the protein at a level where it works or it doesn't. And there's a lot more work to be done before we could eliminate the protein tests. I'm seeing that I'm getting this about right from colleagues in the audience. Eliminate the protein tests and move to just genomics. So at the moment, until we know more, we'd be adding a cost with no patient benefit. So I've left it open that we need to review it on a regular basis, but it is not ready to do at this time. I think I see, Steve, are you wanting to come in on this? Uh, no, but I, I, oh. I'm happy to come in on the Please uh, do, uh, yes. On, on John's question. I, I, yeah, yeah. I think the issue of involvement of industry, it, it's all around how you phrase the question. So I think if you phrase the question to that woman saying that Company X had developed an anti-leukemia drug, and, and they thought that the person's genetic background would influence how many people would be cured of leukemia and how many wouldn't, and her background data would be very useful to that study in knowing how frequent that genetic polymorphism was, she'd immediately say, I'd love to help those poor people with leukemia, and, um, and, and therefore please allow, allow, allow that information to be used by this company that's trying to cure leukemia in these people. So I think if you phrase it in that, uh, I mean, industry is a very, you know, in, 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 a, in an isolated manner, it's a very barren, well, I think they do a very bad job in, in, in promoting the benefits that, that we have had from them. For instance, HIV, I think, isn't celebrated uh, uh, nearly enough as a, as, a, as a triumph of the combined nation of the patient group, academia, and industry working together to you know, effectively solve a major problem uh, over the last 25 years. And I think industry did a terrible job in, 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 in the PR of, of that. Um, so I think we need to help them um, by actually making those vignettes and stories about how drugs have actually worked to cure individuals' cancers. And those drugs didn't just happen by the magic money tree. They did happen uh, by the efforts of, of, of industry, by and large. There, aren't, you know, there are some examples now. I think uh, uh, um, uh, Cuba is having a burgeoning biotech industry, but, there, but, but, but mostly it is uh, industry that has have delivered uh, these new therapies that have been so beneficial to us. So at least in the current model, we, we need to work with them very closely. Mike, I think you've... Yeah, to just on commercialization. Well, I think it's, this is a really difficult kind of issue. Uh, I think lots of people worry about it. The Wellcome Trust conducted a survey in, within the last year which showed how much people are worried about these, recognizing both the huge benefits of genomics and data-driven science, but also the, the risks, the worries. And I, for someone like me, I have a lifelong commitment to the idea of the NHS as a public service, and I've mentioned equity issues and the excellence of service issue. And, and, and I've tried to hold on to, and I hold, I've held on to those commitments, but it's become increasingly apparent through my involvement in medical research over many years as, as an ethicist that, it's, that much of the best science and must, much of the best development in this area involves the close involvement of technology partners, of commercial partnerships. And so that's, that appears to be true. Um, and if we look at the rest of our lives, other areas in our lives, you know, Google Maps, etc., there's a whole range of ways in which commercial companies have done things which have been incredibly useful to us and don't appear to be the kind of things that could be done by a public uh, body. So I, I think there's a real struggle here. We ha I think if we really want the best medicine, we really want the best interventions, we're going to have to accept that commercial and technology relationships are going to be part of that. And the key difficulty is how can we hang on to, and, and, and sort of lock in the, the important commitments to equity uh, and quality of care and the public ethos whilst allowing that to happen. And that's not an easy matter. And that's why the public needs to be so deeply involved in this discussion, because my my feeling is the harms of not doing this are actually greater than the harms of doing it. Uh, and that's not to say it's, I don't, you know, it's not an easy matter, nonetheless, but nonetheless, I think we're going to have to go that way. So just to come back to the, the first question that was asked, uh, I think the question is, was suggesting that five years might be a bit soon to be implementing some of this. As, as the person who's really deeply involved in that implementation, do you agree with that? 
Well, I wonder if I could answer it slightly differently, which is if we think about where we are with cancer care in this country, in some cancers, we've not made any major impact on survival for over a decade now. If we really want to fundamentally change outcomes, then think of a world whereby all patients who have a diagnosis of cancer do have their whole genome sequenced and what could be, for example, driven in terms of drug discovery. But we're not there at a moment in time. And I think what this, uh, the reports helpfully outlined is we need to do more testing than we're doing at the moment. And we need to do that in a way that is systematic and where patients would get the greatest benefit. And one of the things that we're doing in conjunction with Genomics England, using all the evidence that we're gathering in the 100,000 Genomes Project, but from other initiatives, not just in this country, but uh, uh, overseas, is to say, where should we use more extensive testing? Where do we need to promote, for example, single gene testing to drive rapid uh, treatment decisions? But where might we, could we head towards um, whole genome sequencing, which will give us much greater information uh, about that cancer, how it might evolve, that would give better outcomes. So it will be a spectrum, I think, of testing that will be introduced. But what I think in the short term we're going to do is to make sure there's more systematic testing and we reduce the variability <coughs> and build upon the knowledge and evidence that's in the literature. Out for more questions. Ron Zimmerman, PhD Foundation. Question really more for you, Sue, perhaps, than Sally. And that is we've heard about all sorts of people you're trying to influence. But what about health service managers? The health service is at a fairly precarious place at the moment. I mean, there's financial stringency, and the managers seem to be at the center of this, both on the provider side and the commissioner side. So what sort of education are they being given? What instructions might they be given through perhaps um, uh, academic health science centers and things that they have to take this stuff seriously? And I remember very well in the mid-80s when Amur Gray in Oxford set up um, a program called GRIP, Getting Research into Practice, where the outcomes of this were actually in the chief executive's targets of district health authorities, and those targets got met pretty quickly. So thank you very much, Juan, for that uh, question, because there's no doubt about it, we have to take managers and commissioners on this journey with us. I think through the, the creation of 13 genomic medicine centres, though, we've had, there's been a higher level of management engagement in the NHS contribution to the 100,000 Genomes Project than we probably could have ever envisaged through them chairing partnership boards, through coming together to um, take strategic investment decisions to ensure that the NHS contribution to the 100,000 Genomes Project is, is done. Um, I think we're at the start of that journey and there's more to do. And that's why I think in taking forward a genomic medicine service for the NHS through to 2021, we need to evolve the role of the NHS genomic medicine centres to ensure that they fully um, cover the care continuum and engage managers and commissioners because it can't all be done centrally. It needs to be done locally and it needs to be embedded with education and training for those managers and commissioners as much as they do uh, for uh, professionals. And that's how we will get a fully informed system. I'm Artie Patel. I work as an information officer at Unique, uh, supporting families living with rare chromosome gene disorders. Um, there's been a lot of talk about Generation Genome today, um, and I'm also studying the MSc in Genomic Medicine as well at St. George's. Um, one of the challenges that a lot of our families at Unique face is getting support through the NHS in terms of getting health professionals to understand their disorders, so from physiotherapists, mental health specialists, speech therapists. I was wondering how this project is going to help educate those professionals in ways that they can better support our families and our patients. Hi, Charlotte Tomlinson, genetic counsellor at Guy's Hospital. 
Currently, within clinical genetics, we're faced with the issue of variants in genes changing in pathogenicity. So both we find that variants have become pathogenic, and also some have been reported as not being as pathogenic as we first thought, which obviously has big implications for our patients. I guess I'm wondering, at the moment we're analysing these genomes based on the data we know, but that information will change in five years possibly. So what is being put in practice in relation to how we transfer that change in information to our patients, who's responsible for it, and how do we manage that? Because it's definitely a problem currently. So what will it be like when we've got 20,000 genes worth in future? My name's Anna Middleton and I'm also a genetic counsellor and I work at the Wellcome Genome Campus. My question also follows the previous two questions and it's about the actual conversations that are happening on the ground at the moment with patients. Um, my observation um, from my genetic counselling colleagues that are in clinic at the moment is that they are really struggling. They're the ones that are having to describe what a pathogenic variant is, what a variant of uncertain significance is and what a polymorphism is to their clinical colleagues who are non-specialist who are also having to describe this to their patients. Now in the MSc genomic medicine courses, the communications modules are optional. They're not mandatory. So in the training and the transformation of the NHS training, the communication side of it is just optional. And so my question is, what interventions are you putting on the ground at the coalface to actually help with the communication now? We know that science is rarely right now and forever. I mean, gravity is set. But a lot of these things, as you so well described, because it's modern science, the severity uh, of a mutation is, and, the, and therefore our approach changes over time. It may be that we didn't get it right up front. It may be that there are genetic modifiers in the genome and we haven't understood them. And the great advantage of doing this with a major database and great bioinformaticians is that if we standardize the phenotype data, and I was horrified to discover that was not standardized across the country, the genome medicine centers have now standardized on HPO. But if we standardize that and collect it, then we can look at this data, not just once and here's your answer, but this is the gold standard as we understand it now. But we will be able to use that data to build our knowledge and understanding of what the reality is. And as a new driver mutation or something comes, we can see whether it impacts. We will be able to go back and learn from it so that the reality of the moment improves as we go forward. So I, I think it is difficult, but you're experienced in that. And to know that we are looking at that and trying to make sure that reality moves with science, I hope will reassure you. I do think it's difficult for counsellors about explaining, not just to patients, but to people in the NHS. And that's why I use this word science to patients, democratising. And I've got recommendations about education. Sue and I are in absolute agreement. We aren't where we want to be. We need to take it forwards, and you've given a good suggestion. And I remember, I'm a sickle cell doctor originally, that I used to see patients from all around the country, and one of the difficult things was when I would say to them towards the end, you now know more about your disease, not only because you live with it, but because you've talked to me as an expert, than all the doctors in your hometown. How are you going to handle that? How are you going to live with it? How are you going to get the best out of the service? And I always have that conversation because that was the reality. And that's not going to change. Where disorders are not frequent, not everyone will have an understanding. We have to help patients understand how to negotiate the system. Good, does Mike, yeah, it does follow on from that. Um, I'm really starting from the point uh, at the, uh, the back. I think it, one of the questions we're going to have to address, which is an ethical question, but it's also a resource question, which is what is the nature and the scope of the responsibilities, the duties of care, to take up you know, of all the people who are going to be working in this genomic service? So we're used to the idea that genetic counsellors, geneticists have obligations to their patients. But there's going to be a much wider range of people involved in this process. There are going to be uh, people managing databases, uh, computational biologists. There's going to be a whole range of people here. To what extent do these people have an obligation, uh, for example, to 
to uh, go back when some new finding is found and so on, is that to go back to clinical services, go back to patients. And it clearly can't be the case, having spent a lot of time sitting in clinical genetics units and other areas of medicine, it can't be the case you should have to follow up everyone at all times. So there are difficult questions to be asked about the nature of the duty of care, not only about the skills, as it were, the, the skills, skills and knowledge, but also what, what's the nature of that obligation. So that's one thing. And there's another side to that, because many of those questions are going to be ethical questions. You know, there are other patients I could see uh, here if I wasn't going out looking for people to give updated scientific information to. So there's a, there are inevitably going to be tensions there. And so a question we need to ask ourselves, I think, in much the same way as we're asking questions about preparedness of scientific, on scientific and, clinic, scientific and clinical terms, is to what extent do we feel confident in what's required for uh, the services to be ethically prepared, as it were, to, for people being faced with these difficult decisions to have the support they need and the training they need to make those difficult decisions and be able to justify them. Steve. Yeah, I'll just take two of the points. One is, will all this stuff make genetic counsellors' lives better or worse? Uh, I would say probably short-term worse because I think there is going to be increasing complexity and it's going to be a period of real difficulty because when we open the lid on the extent of human genetic variation, it is going to provide challenges. But I think as we work on these genes and as we do the biology and downstream biology, we will learn more. When we, for instance, last year, in collaboration with institute, an institute in Boston, made every single possible mutation in a particular gene and studied every possible mutation and ended up with a table that we can now give to clinical geneticists which say if you, so these, some of these mutations don't exist yet, but we've made every possible one. So, so, so we can produce a table which says this one will cause disease and this one won't. And that is something that a clinical geneticist could pop up on their computer screen and say, uh, so that's a model of how the future may look once we really have in-depth biological understanding. But no one said it was going to be simple because biology is incredibly complex and human individuality is very complex. And, I, and my heart goes out to the rarest disease, the unique, uh, because we, you know, we, we look after a group of patients with extreme insulin resistance. They're, they're rare individuals, but they're not unique. And yet, you, you, know, you, can, you can understand how we can get a collection of professionals together who have real deep understanding, dietitians, nurses, etc., and can provide what you want. But it's difficult when disorders are so rare to, find, to how, how, we, how we address that. I think we have to be very clever about grouping disorders together and getting groups of expertise and then those people need to be able to train out of the country. They need to be hubs uh, 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 of education for patients who happen to live miles away from their massive regional centre. Uh, but no one's pretending that's easy either and I don't have any simple answers to it. But I think that, you know, the, 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 the recognising that these cottage hospitals <laughs> actually have real sources of expertise in certain disease areas, making sure they don't disappear and nurturing them so that they can provide both direct care to patients with rare diseases but also educate around the country. That's where, where I think rather than just doing the DNA test in those cottage places but actually providing direct hands-on care for patients is what was, is really going to happen. So the, the, the question also about professions allied to medicine, the physiotherapists, the other uh, professionals who, who so often have a, a key role in care. I mean, one of the things the Health Education England Genomics Education Programme has been doing is through the Genomic Medicine Centres and through the Masters in Genomic Medicine that's been established, is really to open up that education and training to the, all members of the multidisciplinary team. And this has, for example, included physiotherapists. But really, this is just the tip of the iceberg in terms of the people that new, do need to be educated and trained. So we have to continue to be innovative in the type of education and training interventions that, that are offered, but also to think creatively about, for example, how we improve uh, the genomics conversation and skill up the, the broader clinical team in, in, in more basic genomic counselling skills and in delivering a service for the future, uh, wrap in to um, the multidisciplinary teams of the future as we work through Sally's recommendations in this area, the role that the clinical genetic service and clinical um, genomic counsellors have in supporting other members of the clinical team. But we won't really realise the, ben the benefits of this genomic revolution unless this does broaden out 
into other clinical specialties, but it's about working together as a team, harnessing and garnering the, the expertise that helps in terms of the interpretation and the type of testing that can be done. And importantly, going back to the point that was made about pathogenic variants. I think one of the things that we've learned through the 100,000 Genomes Project is the importance of standardizing the approach to reporting variants and variants of unknown significance, but also how we need to work with other international collaborators to better uh, define that. And part of the future will be how can we issue what are standardized reports for genomics instead of various different iterations of that, but also communicate to patients when they could be recontacted when new evidence emerges. And I think that's part of the benefit in driving an enhanced clinical interpretation of the data, not just for now, but for the future to benefit individuals, but also their families. Fantastic. Thank you to, to Sally, to Mike, uh, to Sue and Steve for a really interesting discussion. We're a small charity and we need your help. And that's why I'm urging you to become a friend of PET, Progress Educational Trust, this evening. If everyone in this room, and some of you already do, thank you very much, support us through our Friends Scheme, then we can put on an event like this. And just for a really small commitment of £3 per month. So it's like a cup of coffee. Also, you can donate by text, and I did hear a little ping during the proceedings, so I'm optimistic I'll be checking the balance. The CMO states in her report that we need to make genomics everybody's business. And that's something that a Progress Educational Trust we've been passionate about for many, many years. And so she can certainly count on our support on this going forward. Because this is transformational to healthcare and it's happening, and, but we need to keep talking about it. And I think that's come across in the questions that have come from the audience and in the responses that we've had from the panel to, to Dame Sally's report. And we'd like to thank our partners, Genomics England, because it's been a real pleasure to work with you guys on this, and we look forward to doing more of the same in Manchester, my hometown, next. And um, so I can't wait for that. I thank, would like to thank the Welcome, because without their generous support, a lot of our work wouldn't be possible, and they've really helped our charity keep going over the years. I have to thank my wonderful volunteers, um, all amazing, and you know, just run registration on their own this evening without any help, certainly from me, because I just get in the way. So thank you, and for all the other things that you do behind the scenes. So last, but by no means least, I'd like to thank the speakers and the chair for sharing their expertise this evening. And I'd like to thank you, the audience, because without your participation and your questions, we don't have an event. So please don't forget to hand in your forms um, on your way out and continue the discussion informally over some refreshments that we're having uh, in the room where you registered. So thanks very much to the panel and to you, the audience. <laughs>